Is there, Is there anybody, anybody out there? there? The lights in the night sky. Sky watchers. Sky watchers. We're watching. We're watching. Did you see that? Here. On EngageLife.fm. Welcome to Sky Watchers. We're watching the skies in North Carolina and all over the world. I'm very excited to have Israel Curiel with us tonight. He is the Public Relations Director for the North Carolina Chapter of MUFON. And I would like you to share with us why you got interested in UFO. Uh, sure. It's, um, it's kind of a long story, but my first exposure to the subject was uh, when I was 17. I had a friend who I was visiting, and uh, she had told me that she grew up on a farm in Kansas, and that one night her and her mother were walking through the field, and they were literally chased by some UFOs. It wow. scared them so much that they got in the truck, uh, left the farm, left the state, and never actually went back. And they must have been terrified. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other thing, when she told me the story, I thought, number one, you're crazy. And number two, you really scared me by just telling me that. I never actually spoke to her again. That was my first oh, my the subject. Yes. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I look back on that, and I feel so much guilt for having done that to someone who bared their soul to me. So that was my but, first exposure. But it's a typical reaction for a lot of people, isn't it? Yes. Unfortunately, it is. That is the what you typically expect aren't familiar with the subject. Okay. Now, you are the Public Relations Director for MUFON, would you tell our listeners what MUFON is exactly? Sure. Uh, MUFON stands for the Mutual UFO Network. And uh, our mission is the scientific studies of the UFO phenomenon for the benefit of all humanity. Uh, so we are trying to approach the, we are trained to approach the subject from a scientific point of view. Uh, we collect sightings and we try to determine First of all, that it's not natural. Second, that it's not uh, a plane, Venus, uh, something that we can identify. Once we've exhausted all possibilities, then we will catalog them as unidentified. Uh, but we try to do as much research and you know, to, to determine what the weather's like. And just try to get uh, extinguish any other possibilities to come to a determination. Um, so. You know, we, we have these forms that we fill out that have literally hundreds of fields, and there's all these little attributes that we collect, like uh, the distance you the witnesses from the object, the time of day, the elevation that you're looking at, the estimated distance uh, from the person, and those are things that kind of help us determine the possible size of the object that they're witnessing. Wow. And we talked last week about being a credible witness when you uh, have a UFO sighting, to be sure your camera's on a flat surface where you can get a steady picture and mm -hmm. noting the weather, all those things help. And MUFON has an interactive map of all the UFO sightings all over the world, and I found that to be pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the frequent questions I get is, can you... Can People always say, well, can't you tell me a hot spot? And to be real honest, I wouldn't say there is one hot spot. Honestly, there are UFO sightings everywhere. You can't imagine how common it is. Uh, being the public direct, or relations director, myself and Lakita Adams, the North Carolina State Director, we travel around the state lecturing and inviting speakers to lecture at our meetings. And the biggest thing that we find is everywhere we go, we have people saying that they've had UFO sightings. The problem is the same people, when you ask them, did you file a report? I would say 9 out of 10 do not file a report. Uh, even more, let's say if we go to a meeting, we'll have 60 attendants. 24 of them will say that they have seen a UFO. But maybe wow. one of those people will say they've actually filed a report with MUFON. And it's all different kinds of people, professional, doctors, everyday people. Yes, 
Now, we what you know, we try to ask our witnesses about their education, their uh, the profession, to try to st- establish their credibility. Um, we find that a lot of our our witnesses tend to be more educated than the general populace because it usually takes somebody who's educated to go and research where to file a report. So we talk to ex- executives, anchors, business owners, uh, engineers. I mean, the whole gamut. It's very rare that I talk to Billy Bob, you know, a farmer, a truck driver. Um, most of the people that we talk to are actually very educated professionals. And, you know, I'm very impressed by the people, uh, for instance, who testified at the Citizens Hearing for Disclosure. Mm-hmm. I was particularly impressed with Paul Hellyer. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. he is currently right now speaking and telling uh, about all the things that he knows about UFOs. And kudos to him for not being afraid to do that. Yeah. Uh, he's. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw the interview that he did with the a TV show called Russia Today, and on the yes. TV show he did. You know, he went he went forward and talked about a lot of stuff. Um, some of the things that we were hesitant to talk about because it, it does seem very fan, fantastical. Now, I won't tell you that it's not like I, I, I don't hear about them. We do, but MUFON's main approach is we want to prove that this is a very real uh, uh, a very real situation that we need to study by looking at the numbers. Uh, my day job is actually a data analyst. I do uh, business intelligence for a large corporation, and I actually enjoy looking at the numbers. My job, my career is all about uh, coming up with theories or, or looking at trends, doing trend analysis. Well, our MUFON online database currently has 52,000 cases online. So from those cases, I'm able to do some statistical analysis. I can tell you that most of our sightings occur between the months of July and October. I can tell you that most of the sightings occur between 9 p.m. and 1 to 3. We'll say 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. seems to be the highest, uh, uh, the best time to have a UFO sighting. And I can tell wow, you that I never knew there that. are, yes, I can tell you that uh, just, just by North Carolina, I can tell you that our North Carolina best hotspot is Wilmington. I can't tell you how many times we hear reports of people seeing the orange orbs, which are reported all over the world, right, coming in from the ocean, or or a lot of people who will stay at the condos in. Uh, Wilmington or Myrtle, North Myrtle Beach will actually see them pop out of the water and come in over land. Wow. And I have made an observation that there are a lot of reported orange-colored orbs or discs. Yep. I actually have seen one of them now myself. Oh, um, wow. Tell us about that. So uh, being in MUFON, I have now had two UFO sightings in Needless to say, I will go to the places that have this frequent UFO sighting. In uh, Myrtle Beach, North uh, South Carolina, there was a uh, UFO abduction museum that I wanted to go visit. So I went there on a family trip. We went to the museum. And was, I thought it was very well done. And in the evening, I sat um, on the beach in, uh, what is it, Surfside. I set up my chair, I got a video camera on the tripod, and I sat there from 10 p.m., and I, I, would, I said that I was going to stay there till 12.30. So 12.30 comes around. It, it wasn't too bad. It was, I think it was September 30th. And I ended up staying till 1.30 in the morning. And at 1.30, I decided, you know what, hey, you know, it was a long shot, packing up my stuff, and I'm getting ready to go. Folded my chair, put up the camera, put up my tripod, and I turned around, started walking towards the parking lot. And right then, I'm looking up, and I see an orange orb. It's about 100 feet off the ground. It, I guess it, it estimated the dimension, the diameter was maybe four feet across. Um, it was probably moving between 75 and 100 miles an hour. So I saw it coming in from land. It's coming in from land towards the beach. 
And when it got almost over me, it did a 90-degree turn north and he- headed straight up the beach. This lasted, mm, this setting lasted about eight seconds, and it took me about three seconds to realize, oh, my God, I'm looking at it, and I'm breaking <laughs> out the camera. I'm waiting, and you know, it takes a second or two to boot up, and I point my video camera, and you know, it's, it's trying to focus, and by the time it's focusing, it's too far away, and I've got nothing. Oh, wow. So it's so exciting when time. you realize you have one in view, isn't it? Yes. So that was, uh, that was a pretty uh, uh, stunning sighting that I've had. That's actually the second astonishing sighting I had. Uh, you, you know, you, you keep talking about, or we always think that, oh, it's got to be, if you see something, how could you not get a picture of it? Unfortunately, a lot of times our sightings tend to be just a couple of seconds long. Uh, yes. But these astonishing sightings that a lot of people have are so shocking that even we get so many people that never even thought about UFOs. And they have these sightings of craft that are so far beyond our, our level of technology that it really shatters your, your current views on reality. Uh, it does. There is no way that this is this is by no by no chance uh, a Chinese lantern. It is not a flare. It's not a plane because there's no sound. And this particular sighting is a hundred feet away. It's not like I can you know confuse it with some other object. It's not a plane. And you plane know I have it. to laugh at all these lame excuses for what. The UFO was. It was swamp gas or it was a weather condition. They're mm-hmm. really getting inventive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But and... I would uh, like to ask you North Carolina has some really famous uh, UFO cases. Can you tell me what you found to be your most interesting? Well, yeah, absolutely. The most interesting was uh, the case with. Chris Bledsoe, I'm not sure if you know the name. Chris Bledsoe was actually interviewed uh, by MUFON in 98 for a uh, UFO abduction that he had in 97. The information that he provided was so shocking because he had uh, four or five witnesses with him. And... um, the Discovery Channel actually did a one-hour documentary on him. Uh, so in the documentary, they talked to him and they talked to some of the witnesses. And unfortunately, in the in the show, they showed that he did a lie detector test. And unfortunately, he didn't pass. But when you're talking about you're seeing something that is far beyond our current level of technology, and he actually did say that he actually saw a being. When you're talking about so, something so incredibly emotionally challenging, I, I, don't, I don't see how you could maintain your composure. So even, even though they, he failed the lie detector test, I've had many conversations with uh, Chris. And the fact that he describes things that MUFON knew about long before it was in the general, you know, general knowledge convinces me that Chris is the real thing. And, and and fortunately, we've actually had other people come forward at a later time and says, yeah, I didn't say anything about this sighting, but we also saw the crabs over where Chris Bledsoe was. So there have wow. been people confirming his story that you don't even know him. And, and See, it that's might why come it's so important for later. people to call in and report because it, it gives validity when there's multiple reports of a sighting. Absolutely. You know, the cases that we put the most weight on are the ones where there are two, three, or half a dozen witnesses. Uh, I do also want to mention my first uh, sighting occurred on November 5th, 2011. We specifically went to a witness's home. This person later became a MUFON investigator himself. Him and his wife had frequent UFO sightings. So... We had um, we had a, held a MUFON meeting. Uh, it was actually in Hickory, and that evening we went to some.